Uh, very good afternoon to <clears throat> all the participants and uh, our chief guests and all the participants and also those who uh, <clears throat> view and uh, watch on live for, on Facebook. Uh, today is the 2566 2, Buddha Punima Festival. Uh, here we organized <clears throat> by uh, Sarah J. Uh, uh, English translator department. And uh, uh, firstly, I want to say thank you very much for our uh, uh, department uh, director, Venerable uh, Lobsan Dojila, for organizing this uh, meeting. Uh, so, uh, uh, myself, my name is uh, Lobsan Pinzo, and I am a moderator. Uh, of this conference today. And uh, I am uh, one of senior <coughs> student of uh, uh, Sergei English Translator Department. And uh, today we have uh, <coughs> five, nine uh, programs and uh, I'm going to read it here. And uh, uh, so the first uh, program is uh, prayer, prayer. Initial prayer by Venerable Chambar Dorji, and uh, second uh, uh, introduction speech by Venerable Lobsan Dorji. And the third one is <coughs> Birth of Lord Buddha by Venerable uh, Ma Paramaha Sampung. Uh, and uh, fourth one is Enlightenment of Lord Buddha by Venerable Master Tinsi Dorji. And fifth one is turning the three wheels of teaching of Lord Buddha by Venerable Master Tenzi Gaching. And uh, the sixth one is Mahapara Nivana of Lord Buddha by Venerable Buddha Data. And then we have our seventh, we have a question and answer for 20 min uh, 10 minutes. And then we have a panel discussion of life events of uh, Lord Buddha and uh, how the teaching of Lord Buddha promotes world religions harmony for 20 minutes. And then our last program is thank you and a dedication speech by Venerable Hundu Seba. Uh, and uh, that is the, our uh, program. Uh, so uh, before that, I am, please let me know uh, uh, all let, let me announce in Tibetan for those participants who are more comfortable, you know, comfort to listen in the Tibetan language. So, ani thana di chi shuya la thana ngaso ani da jagi dembe shaja tuwa ani zeba ani shi da dembe sagad da vitseba chonga ta jashi chizu chine dus sunzi. Uh, uh, translated in your Kiju Yore and Kaju Tine and in Yenarona Shuayi. Okay, so uh, before uh, before I let the start of our program, I'm just requesting all speakers that let me notice your time before two minutes end of your speech. And uh, also, please, all the other participants must mute your speaker during uh, uh, presentation of each speaker. Okay, so the first program, uh, please uh, start Venerable Chambadoji for your initial prayer. You have five minutes. Chambadoji, unmute your... Uh, okay. okay, first of all, I will... Warm good afternoon to you all and happy uh, to another 2000, uh, uh, 2566 Buddha Purnima. And I will uh, chant the 
at the Buddha place in Tibet, uh, in Pali, and by followed by Tibetan and English language. I think a little bit technical problem here. Sorry. Namo dasa bhagavato arato samya sambuddha. Namo dasa bhagavato arato samma sambuddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arato samma sambuddhasa. Oi, tem boy, jundin de teje, jeba, da jumba, yondo ba, tobi, samje, jeba, do, jazo, deba, dewa, jeba, 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 to the founder, to the endowed, transcend the destroyer, the one gone beyond, the full destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in the good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme gods of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed, transcended destroyer, the glorious conqueror, and the subduer from Sakya Queen. I prostrate, make offering, and go for the view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Venerable Chambadajala. Now our Next is our uh, introduction speech by Venerable Lobsan Doji, uh, the director of uh, Sarah J. Translator Department for seven minutes. Yes, Venerable Lobsan Doji, the mic is yours. Yes, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to extend my heartfelt greetings to all the venerable masters who attended here to mark the uh, to mark and observe the Buddha Punima. And uh, yes, uh, of course, I would like to extend my Takshi uh, Dele to uh, our special guest. Uh, uh, from Maha Sampung, uh, the Vice Director for Academy of Air Language Institute, uh, MCU Talent, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Bud Venerable Buddha Dada, uh, Director of Research Center, Mahabuddha Society, Bangalore. He, he is one of the, my friend, the my friend. And uh, then, uh, yeah, Venerable uh, Bende Jitenzi Doje and uh, Venerable uh, Master Tenzi Galche and uh, all the students uh, and uh, all the students and all the, uh, those uh, who listen to this online program, I would like to extend my heartfelt uh, greetings. And yes, today we all know that today is a very special day to mark uh, the birth of Lord Buddha and uh, to commemorate the, the enlightenment and Mahaparinirvana of the Lord Buddha 
So today is a special day. And uh, we uh, observe this special uh, day. We, we try to um, think on the teaching, uh, think, think on the teachings of the Lord Buddha. Actually, there are the many ways to observe, observe this special festival, uh, Buddha Punima. But uh, um, remembering the teaching of the Buddha and uh, reflecting on the, the message of Lord Buddha is, I think, one of the, the key way to uh, observe uh, the Buddha Punima. This is because that when we uh, think on think on the teachings of Buddha, when we try to remember the very message of the, the Lord Buddha, uh, through the, uh, the thinking and the reflection on the, the message of the Buddha, then we can generate the understanding of those teachings. And the, through the understanding of the, those teachings, then there will be the transformation within us. And when there is the transformation of the, of the mind and heart within us, then there is the transformation of the thoughts. I mean that transformation from the negative thoughts to uh, the positive thought. And when there is the, the transformation of the thoughts, then of course there will be a very uh, uh, constructive attitude, very positive attitude. And through the positive attitude, we can, uh, we, there is a, the more, the more the positive behavior. And through the, when there is the, the transformation of the transformation of a better uh, the behavior, then we can create a really environment where everyone, one and all can experience the joy. We can really, we can really create a, the, the better environment for all, all for, uh, for ourselves and all around us. So this is the way how, the, uh, how we can start a, a happy society through, uh, through the transformation of behavior, through the transformation attitude and mainly through the transformation of the mind. And that the transformation of the mind take place within us by reflecting on the, the message of the Lord Buddha. This is the reason why I feel it's a very important uh, to, preserve, to observe the, the Buddha Punima by reflecting on the message of the Lord Buddha. Of course, the, the praying to the Lord Buddha or the burning incense, uh, uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a part of the observing the Lord Buddha. And Yes, we all know that the Lord Buddha is not just the, the Buddha for us. Actually, I feel that uh, Buddha Punima, I feel that Buddha Punima is a really inspiration for all humanity. Because Buddha was a way, Buddha was an ordinary person. But through his own the practice and understanding, he became a very extraordinary person. This is through his own training, understanding, practice, action, he became finally enlightened one. So it is a, it is a, an, a very great inspiration for all human beings because human can become a very extraordinary human being. Human can, attend the enlightenment on the human birth. So this is a very great, uh, uh, the message for all human beings. But to the philosopher, I think Buddha is the, we can say that Buddha is the father of the, the ancient philosophy. Really he is the, the great philosopher. And to the scientist, I think the really Buddha is uh, one of the really greatest scientists of the ancient time. Because all the, uh, the, the Buddhist, the concept, it uh, depends on the, the logics, on the scientific uh, the findings. 
based on the, the common experience. And uh, of course, to the Buddhist across the world, Buddha is our, the, our Buddha, our, uh, the leader, the teacher. So uh, there are the different aspects of the, of the Buddha. We can see the, the, from, we can, the scientists can uh, see from the scientist aspect of the Buddha. The philosopher can see, look at the Buddha from the, the philosopher aspect of the Buddha. And those human beings can uh, receive the message from the Buddha uh, through the angle of, through the aspect of the human being of the Buddha. And we Buddhists, they can have the worship the Buddha and can go for refuge to the Buddha from the perspective of the, uh, the, 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 the teacher of the Buddhism, the founder of the Buddhism. So I feel, this is the way uh, to look at the aspect of the different aspects of the Buddha. And then the finally, without taking my time, uh, I would like to conclude here. Uh, so this is a really a great platform for us to re reflect on the, the life events of the Buddha. So I would like to listen to you. <laughs> And finally, we can discuss on the life events of Buddha and how to, uh, how to inculcate, how to the, put into action those messages within our daily life and uh, try to take us on a, a better path. So thank you all. And this is my <laughs> final words to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Chamadojila, the director of Sergei Translator Department. Now, the next uh, our topic is about the Lord Buddha uh, by uh, our uh, special guest, Venerable Pramaha Sampong. Uh, let me introduce him a little bit. Uh, Venerable Pramaha uh, Sampong is a PhD deputy, uh, deputy director of Language Institute in Mahachula Longkorn Raja Vidya Laya University in uh, Bangkok and Thailand. And uh, he received novice ordained uh, vows in 1992 and received full ordained vows in uh, in on July 15, 2000. And he has written many research papers and articles on Buddhism. And he has been attending many seminars and conferences in many other countries, such as India, Kingdom of Bhutan, Philippines, Germany, Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, Vietnam, and China. So, uh, uh, so, uh, Venerable uh, Pramah Sampong, uh, you have uh, 12 minutes. The uh, mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Venerable Moderator, Lop Song and uh, Pan Sop. And thank you very much for your intro introducing me. Uh, today, I feel very honest and delighted to be given an opportunity of sharing the message in the special event of the commemoration of the Buddha birth, enlightenment, the returning of the view of the Dhamma and Mahaparinirvana, organized by your Serajai Monastic Translation Department, Serajai Monastic University, to celebrate uh, 2,566 Buddha Purnima. So my topic today will be about uh, the birth of the Buddha. The aim of my, my talk uh, to, uh, is to integrate the concept of the idea of the birth of the Buddha, you know, into the promoting the world peace, the world uh, religious harmony, individual human potentials and happiness. Anyway, I, so I would like to break my uh, talk into the following topics. First, I talk about the general concept of the Buddha, the birth of the Buddha. Uh, next, 
I we come to how we uh, celebrate the birth of the Buddha. Lastly, I deal with how the birth of the Buddha can promote the world peace or the world religious harmony and the birth uh, and uh, the birth of the world peace, individual happiness. So, as we know uh, in the Dharma Bada, the Buddha chapter, Buddha Wako, one saying say, Sukho Buddha Nang Upado. Happy is the birth of all Buddhas. In here, we can see all Buddhas. That means it's not only one Buddha. It means Buddha in the past, Buddha in the present, and the future. Anyways, these stances um, encourage us, you know, to understand how uh, the human beings get happy, the birth of the Buddha. And not only the birth of the Buddha, happy is the preaching of the supply Dharma, Sada Dharma. Happy is the unity of the Sangha. Happy is the destroying of the United One. So anyway, another stanza also give the idea about the human birth is hard to gain. Hard for mortal is their life. To come to the hearing of the supply Dharma also very hard. But the appearance or the birth of the Buddhas very, very rare, very hard. So in this idea, I just would like to let we see the idea of the birth of the Buddha, general concept of the Buddha with my first uh, subtopic. As we know, we as the, the Buddhist or non-Buddhist, we may know that the Buddha himself can be the historical person who was born into this world in Lumbini, present Nepal and ancient Indian continents. He was born into this world as a human form, a baby Buddha. By his um, name, call a Siddhartha, well accomplished. On the other hand, the birth of the Buddha in our uh, philosophical aspect uh, can be uh, taken into three steps. First, birth of the Buddha in human form as a Siddhartha, from the baby into the young man until he got uh, or he attained enlightenment. The second, the birth of the Buddha in, in the Dharma form, not in the human form only, but in the Dharma form. As the Buddha, so-called, in Theravada, we call the Kodama Buddha. In Mahayana tradition or Western tradition, uh, we call the Sakyamuni Buddha. The author connotation for the Buddha, like um, the, the Dharma form, like a Vairochana Buddha, Amidapa Buddha, Adi Buddha, uh, Primordial or Cosmic Buddhas. This is the second meaning. Apart from the human form, we have the Dharma form. And the third one, the birth of the Buddha in the, we call the Anu Buddha form as the Litten Buddha. Anu, Anu is a Pali word. It means the Litten or the one who follow. So that's the, the Litten Buddha in each of us or who follow the Buddha way can be called um, the, the Sangha, Anu Buddha, uh, sometimes we may say the Buddhist assemblies. That's all I have to say about the birth of the Buddha with the limited uh, terms of my speech. It's hard to find is the man supreme. He is not born everywhere, but where such the wise one is born, that families try happily. So this is the first meaning or the first, uh, my first topic about the, the birth of the Buddha with the human form, the Dharma form, and Anubuddha form. And the next one, I would like to, uh, I'll move on to the, how we celebrate the birth of the Buddha. As we know, uh, as the Buddhists, we have the two kinds of the Buddhists. One is we call the traditional Buddhist and non-traditional Buddhist or the modern Buddhist or even what we call the practical Buddhist, I may say. But uh, the two categories, we have to understand some Buddhists, they are Buddhists by birth, by traditions, by uh, older generation, you know, 
And another kind of Buddhist, they are Buddhist by practice. So when we, we, we talk about the celebration, the celebration of this special event in Vesak uh, Punema can be under two headings. The first one, the celebration done by material offerings or maybe the events, holding the event to commemorate by, by uh, activity, by ceremony, by ritual, or even the, the, the flower, you know, the um, uh, material offering, etc. But another one is a celebration by Dharma practice. In this sense, I appreciate, and even the Buddha himself, he appreciate. But anyway, in both traditional um, Buddhist and non-traditional or even practical modern Buddhist, um, we need both, both celebration. I mean the material celebration and the Dharma celebration, the Dharma practice as well. So to practice Dharma is to see the, 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 the Buddha, to worship the Buddha himself, I would like to encourage all Buddhists to celebrate the Buddha by bringing the Buddha Dharma into uh, their way of life, not only the um, celebrate, you know, uh, by materials, uh, offering or uh, worship, you know. So how to do that? As imam, never do harm or destroy another living beings. So in this sense, we need the, the world peace. If, if we live in uh, another or non-Buddhist environments, we also can bring, we ca can integrate, you know, the Dharma, the Buddha Dharma, like um, the, the uh, Ahimsa or is what we call the uh, never do harm, you know, or destroy any another living beings in any other ways, another way, whatever kind of ways. You can increase your perfection by sharing your loving kindness and compassion. But the, the loving kindness and compassion also, uh, you also can uh, share the, 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 as I mentioned, the compassion uh, beyond frontier. So in this sense, it means some of us as a Buddhist, sometimes we share only the loving kindness and compassion to our community, our group, ethnic group or nations or co-nation, whatever. But in the Buddha sense, in wider sense, the loving kindness and compassion must go to the, the global communities or the nations or the group uh, or the even religious group, non-religious group. Sometimes they don't practice any religion. I mean the traditional religion, but the compassion also can go to that person as well, to the human being, to the non-human be being. So this lead to the next point. I would like to say, I'm sure we are aware of both celebration, particularly by practicing the Buddha Dharma. And also, as we know, the birth of the Buddha, I just would like to share. The birth of the Buddha is the birth of the world peace. The birth of the Buddha also the birth of the human potential, human bliss, you know, human happiness. And also the birth of the Buddha is the birth of natural happiness. As we learn that immediately after the Buddha, uh, baby Buddha birth, he stood up and took seven steps and uttered, I am chief of the world. Eldest am I in the world. Foremost am I in the world. This is the last verse. There is now no more coming to be. That means this symbolizes symbolize the potential of human being. One individual <clears throat> a human being that change from depending on the outside refuge into the inside refuge to promote the world peace, not harming any other, respect others, respect another, tolerate others, promoting the universal or boundless loving kindness or compassion. Be, that's I say, uh, compassion beyond frontier. In the Buddha teaching, I would like to quote that. The hard teaching not to do any evil, to do 
to cultivate good, purify one mind. Forbearing passion is the highest authority. Nibbana is supreme. Who harm other is not truly a recluse. Nor is he ascetic who oppresses others, not insulting, not harming, restrained according to the fundamental moral code. Moderation in food, circulated abode, intent on higher thought. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Finally, let me remind you of the sum of the main point that the, the first, the birth of the Buddha, how we celebrate the birth of the Buddha, and how the birth of the Buddha can impact or promote the world peace, the world religious harmony, and the birth of the, the, the world peace, the individual human happiness. So in my, in my conclusion, I would to propose the following strategies, you know, for the, uh, we want, if we celebrate the Buddha to remind us to depend on the human ability, especially the teaching of the karma, own karma, both past and present karma. Depending on human effort, no one can support us without our strength. Depending respect, never do harm to each other or one another. Release ego, minimize uh, our uh, ego. I mean, um, uh, sometimes uh, the non-self, uh, e non this is also how we uh, minimize or how we reduce that within the individual minds. May I thank you all for being such an attentive audience. So that's bring me to the end of my talks. Thank you very much, Verabhan. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, our special guest, uh, Venerable Paramaha Sampong. Thank you so much for your remarkable uh, speech on the Bird of Lord Buddha. So our next uh, uh, program is uh, the topic on enlightenment of Lord Buddha by Venerable Master uh, Tenzin Dorje. Uh, Venerable Master Tenzin Dorje was born in Tibet and he came in India and become a novice uh, in 1994. He joined the Sarajya Secondary School and completed his 10th grade uh, uh, in uh, 2003. He then joined Sarajay Monastery to preserve advanced Buddhist studies. During that, he did main focus on the Buddhist philosophy of four schools, uh, such as uh, Vaibhashika, Sautantra Tika, Chitra Mantra, and uh, Mahay, uh, uh, Madhyamika, and of course, uh, five major texts. And he graduated bachelor's degree in Buddhist philosophy in uh, 2016, and he received bhikshu ordination from His Holiness the Dalai Lama in uh, 2016, and he also completed a three years English translation course and engaged in various translation projects for five years. He participated in Tibetan Thai Sangha exchange program in 2018, and he achieved MA in Buddhist uh, at Mahachula Longkorn Raja Vidya Yala University. And currently, he has been doing PhD research at International Buddhist Studies College. Uh, so, uh, uh, Venerable uh, Tenzi Dojila, please unmute your uh, mic. And you have 50 minutes. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Venerable Opsang Kunsok, for your great introduction. And also, a very good afternoon to all, and also our guests, all the venerables and most respected Achan uh, Prama Sompong. And today, my topic is about the Buddha enlightened. On this occasion, 
special occasion. Uh, we commemorate the Buddha's, or we are celebrating Buddha Purnima or the Buddha Jayanti. So first, I will talk about the two topics. My main topic about the Buddha's uh, enlightened, and after that, I will talk about the, how can we celebrate the Buddha's uh, Buddha Purnima or Buddha Jayanti. So actually, we all know that Buddha enlightened on this uh, uh, by such the month or normally which fall in the April and May. So this year it falls in the May 16th. So first of all, Buddha, uh, when he was prince, normally we say Prince Siddhartha, during that time he's staying in palace and then his life is like a totally luxurious life. So he has everything, he had everything there. So he spent very uh, luxurious lives. And then at the one point he saw all the, suffering of people like aging, becoming old and getting sick and dying. And he saw all those events and also at the end, he saw the ascetic and which walking very peacefully. So he, so uh, at that point, he realized that the, there's a suffering in this life. So he tried to renounce this life, his life. So then he ran away from the palace and renounced his life. And he, so he tried to practice so then during that day, more than six years and he went many teachers his first teacher is called alara kalama from whom he learned till eight jhana so but when he reached he reached that eight jhana so the, his teacher mentioned this is the highest achievement but for for him but for the siddhartha prince siddhartha or we can say bodhisattva the siddhartha or the, before Buddha, he enlightenment, he didn't satisfy that achievement. So he knew that this is not end of his uh, success or end of his, uh, what he is pursuing, what he is trying to achieve. So this achievement cannot eliminate the root of suffering. So then he went away from the teacher and he tried to search, and he tried to search the truth of suffering. What is the real cause of suffering? Then he went further and he made the Utega or Ramabutra, second teacher, where he learned the ninth jhana. <clears throat> but still, that ninth jhana is not the end of his achievement and he need more understanding. So he, through this way, he struggled, he tried to learn, he tried to practice whole six years. And then at the end of six years, he practiced the self-mortification, self-mortification, which means he tried very hard and without eating food. So at the end, he reached the stage where he cannot work, he cannot stand up, he cannot practice. So that is a self-mortification. It seems like he, he's, he himself torturing or he is torturing himself. So through this practice, he realized that he cannot gain any knowledge. He cannot gain the ultimate goal. He cannot get the he cannot see or he cannot realize the ultimate nature ultimate truth so he cannot so then he tried to practice the normally we say middle way which is between the two end one is self indulgence and another one is like a self modification so he practiced middle way to gain the ultimate knowledge to gain the enlightenment to become the buddhahood to realize the ultimate source or ultimate cause of suffering and all these things. <laughs> so then, under, so and before the full moon day or before the Vaisak the month, so he the, stay under the body tree and then he try to meditate. Before he meditate or before he sit the tree, he himself take oath or he himself uh, made a resolution that he is going to practice Till he realized the truth, till he understand the ultimate nature, he understand ultimate truth, and then he sit under the Bodhi tree and he take Madam that resolution, and I'm not going to stand up even he with the die. So then he take that resolution and sit under the Bodhi tree and he practice all eight noble folds and all those things, and then at the end he realized the ultimate truth through the practicing mindfulness and through the practice through the all the realizing that will in the dependent link and then he realized the truth of all the suffering why he we become all why we become dying why we become why we seek and all those suffering he realized the reason he realized the causes 
of all those things. And then he Buddha become on the dawn of the, the 15th, he become enlightened. So this is the very short way how Buddha become enlightened. So normally we all know how Buddha enlightened. The main thing here is, so how can we celebrate, how can we commemorate the Buddha's Buddha Purnima or Buddha Jayanti? <laughs> normally, even in Tibetan, we say the best way of celebrating is the learning what Buddha he achieved, what Buddha learned, what Buddha preach, or practicing Buddha's main teaching. So in Tibetan, we say normally, <clears throat> so this is my second topic, what I'm going to share here. So the, normally we have to celebrate Buddha's Buddha Purnima in our daily life, a day-to-day -day life, not just at this occasion. This is a special occasion, but we have to celebrate Buddha's teaching, Buddha, Buddha Dhamma, so in daily life. So we, normally we say in Tibetan, there's a two way of celebrating. So the, the, the Buddha's teaching Lokpatthusam, which is normally we say in Tibetan Lokpatthusam and Pongwasam there. So we have to Lokpatthusam and Pongwasam there. Normally we can translate in English or in Pali, normally they say Patipati or the Variati and Patipati Pativeta or Chintam, the Sutmaya, Chintamaya and Bhavanamaya. This is three things. Or normally we can say three trainings, but listening and the contemplating and then the meditating or reflecting what we learn from the station to reflect ourselves. So, so then what I'm going to share here is as, as a Tibetan monk, as a Vajrayana Buddhist monk, so I spent more than 20 years in India in my monastery, Saraji Monastery. So we, we, in our monastery, we are focusing much on the Lokpatthasam. So we just like a Patipati and Pariyati and Patipati. There we, we are learning, we are spending most of a monastery monk. There are more than 3,000 monks in my monastery. So we are spending more than 20 years. Some monks spending 26, 25 years for learning Buddha's teaching at the beginning to the end. So we are spending. So that means daily life, we are spending that much. I mean, we are spending that much to learning Buddha's teaching. This is what also one way of the celebrating Buddha's teaching for the first two portions. Like Lokpatthasam, Tewa, and Tewa, and Samba, which just means the hearing or with listening to the teaching and the understanding of the teaching. So Lokpatthasam and the Pongwasam there, which is the third part or from the Pariyati, Patipati and Padivet or Patipati can be, or Sutmaya, Chintmaya and Bhavana Maya. Bhavana means the meditating or contemplating or reflecting. So what we learn from Buddha's teaching, spending all those years. So we have to reflect Buddha's teaching our daily life. So. In, 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 in my monastery, we are learning that much. So in, I can see from Thailand, so the, in the Thai monk and Theravada monk, they are spending their time on the third one, like Poma something or meditating. So I can see here, the most many monks from the forest monk, or also those monks, they are spending their life for the meditating, reflecting. So this is also, this is also one good platform where we can share together the, these two knowledge. In Thailand, they are focusing on the third portion of the Bhavanamaya and also in the monastery, they are learning that much. So this is also a good stage to sharing. And also here also we have many teachers also from the, uh, our Westeros. Uh, so you, you can, we can uh, ask question him and also the, this is a good place to sharing or exchanging knowledge. So, so that's uh, my second part of the portion. So, and also thank you very much for inviting me here and then I will stop my uh, talk speech here. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for venerable uh, Tinsi Dojila for your remarkable speech, thank you so much. So <clears throat> uh, right now actually we have our uh, Tinsi Gachi speech but uh, because of our of our venerable Buddha Data schedule, he has to participate in another conference at three o'clock. So he has to, so that's why he has to speak after, uh, I mean, uh, after Tenzi Doji. So venerable um, Buddha Data will express or uh, on the topic Mahaparinivana and uh, venerable uh, Bhikshu, Buddha Data was born in Odisha in uh, uh, 1987. He was ordained as a Theravadin Buddhist monk at age of 19 by the most venerable Acharya Buddha Rak uh, Kita. He learned Vinaya, Sutra, Abhidhamma, and 
Pali and Buddhist meditation from Acharya. At present, he serves as a director of Mahabodhi Research Center at Bangalore, which is a pioneer center for Buddhist studies and practice. He has written books, many books and articles on Buddhism and attended many seminars and conferences. And he had traveled in many other many countries and spread the universal teaching of love, compassion, for sake of others, well fair and uh, uh, happiness. So uh, it's yours, Venerable Bhikshu Buddha Dada, for 12 minutes. You have to unmute. Thank you. OK. Venerable, can you just check the audio? Could you be able to hear me? Am I audible? Yes, I can hear. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa Homage to the Blessed One, to the Perfect One, the Rightly Awakened One. Salutation to my teacher, Venerable Acharya And uh, salutation to the Sangha members who are joined here today. And uh, a heart, hearty Vaisa greetings to all of you. And my regards to Bhante Pramha Sampo. Teach to you, Bande from India, from land of Buddha, and uh, Bande Tenjin Dorje. I, I heard about you. Maybe you might know some of our friends in uh, IVC from Mahabodhi. And uh, Panjur, also my good friend. Greetings to you. And uh, Tenjin Gese, Happy Vesak, and Lundu Sopa. Uh, venerable, my heartfelt greetings to you as well, and all the listeners and participants. Uh, it is indeed my great honor, I would say, and uh, my, uh, I'm so fortunate to be part of this uh, um, uh, program, the conference which is now going on. And this is possible because of uh, when Panjur has told me, Bhante, you please uh, attend this seminar. So I said, okay, um, why not? Because the Buddha have uh, sacrificed so much for us. Uh, for countless life, you have to fulfill his perfections and then become an enlightened, ma enlightened one. And uh, with boundless compassions and love, he preach the Dhamma to us. So it is up to us that how we carry forward the legacy of Lord Buddha. And the day like this, on uh, Vaisak Day, um, we have to reflect upon the nature of the Buddha. And, uh, his birth, his enlightenment, and his Purnipana. These are the, the blessed events which occurred on the same day, but also at the same time. The three, even though it seems to be a, a different events, but ultimately it gives us the same meaning. The Buddha born, that means the, he, he brings forth the Bodhi, the Bodhi is born, and he preaches his noble truths and noble eightfold path to us. And after 45 years of mature days, Buddha also subject to decay. The Buddha is not escaped from this, uh, you know, the condition phenomena. You know, a person who, once we are born, we have to go through these stages of life. But until we reach the Nibbana, the highest freedom, that means we have to go through this recurring existence we are in samsara. So Buddha's birth is the birth of enlightenment. And he, he's, he preached us the way to the enlightenment. And at the same time, in the Parinivana Sutta, Buddha says, Andadani uh, Bikhavi, Amantaya Mivo, Vayadhamma Sankhara, Appamadena Sampadit. A omniscient Buddha who having attained the sub submit state of enlightenment, but the Buddha's advice to us is to not to be heedless. Practice the Dharma with diligence, with sincerity, heedfulness, until the final liberation is reached. So this shows that upper mother, we have to live mindfully and heedfully until we reach to the highest goal. Because if we don't, don't reach the goal, then we are insecure. We are insecure and we may take repeated birth again. So 
Now, how we we have to reflect upon this the events of Parinibbana, which shows us that we have to really practice the Dharma in our life. The Patipati Puja, as Ajahn was mentioning about, how do we celebrate the Buddha's birthday uh, by by offering flowers in material way, or really we have to uh, bloom that flower in our hearts. We have to bring about that flower of Bodhi in our heart. We would become a real followers of Lord Buddha if we actually put into practice his teachings. You know, in Buddha's time, there was a monk called Dhamma Rama. And this venerable monk, when he heard about the Buddha, Buddha's uh, impeding Bhairavada, so he didn't choose to go to the Buddha. All the monks were crying and the lay people were talking together to the um, Salavana, where the Buddha was lying in the twin, midst of twin Sala tree. And Dhamma Rama chose to go to under a tree and to the under foot of a tree to meditate there. Other monks are lamenting and uh, they say, well, the Buddha will pass away very soon. But how come this monk actually don't pay respect to the Buddha? He should go and meet him and uh, exchange greetings and maybe clarify his doubt offer some flowers and so forth. But uh, Dhamma Rama chose to be a true disciple by practicing Dhamma. So he put forth his effort and uh, in the three months of time, he gained enlightenment. He became an Arya. And later this monk should go, went unto the Buddha and complained, Oh Lord, Dhamma Rama is something different. He's not coming along with us to pay homage to the Buddha, to the but the Buddha actually praised Dhamma Rama. He says, Dhamma Ramo, Dhamma Ratu, Dhammang Anuvichintaya, Dhammang Anusarang Bhikkhu, Saddhamana Parihayati. He says, Dhamma Rama, one who takes delights the Dhamma, one who actually practices in Dhamma, Dhamma Ratu, Dhammang Anuvichintaya, one who reflects upon Dhamma and who follow in accordance with Lord's Buddha, Lord Buddha's teachings. He is my true disciple. So the message of Lord Buddha is very clear to us because one who sees the Dhamma, you only can see the Buddha. I sure the Buddha also said that you mankasati is so mankasati. So when we realize the Dhamma in our heart, that means we realize the Buddha, Buddha nature in our heart. So in this uh, conference, as we are all together to sharing our thoughts and views, this is very clear that we have to bring about uh, our more determination. We have to set on our mind to, to practice the Dhamma more sincerely. And we try to remove our own defilements, lower dosa and moha from the mind. And also the ignorance, we have to strive on our own deliverance as the Buddha. But the Buddha cannot take us on his shoulder to Nibbana, that is for sure. <laughs> so this is up to us. And through us, we can lead others. Through our life, we can lead other people as the followers of God. Because imagine that we are in a big boat and we are sailing through these turbulences in an ocean. And uh, monks are the leaders. So the lay people are also there in that boat. We are all heading towards that final, that safe and other soul of Nibbana. So today, um, so I would say this much, like the Buddha also said in one of the sutras, he says, the person who lives by the Dhamma is protected by Dhamma. And just like one is holding and being a big umbrella in the rainy season. You are not affected by rain. Rain is nothing but all these turbulences outside. So, with that uh, reflections, uh, we have to bring in the Dhamma in our life and uh, then obey our real puja, our own respect and reverence to the Buddha. So, once again, uh, I think I have taken up my time already. Um, Venerable Lovzati as the moderator of the time enough to give you a chance to present here. Yeah. So also Panjur and everyone of you. So lots of uh, thanks uh, and Meta, Vesa greetings from Abode, Bangalore. Thank you.
thank you very much thank you thank you thank you very much for uh venerable buddha data for your remarkable speech on mahaparinirvana of lord buddha thank you so much for your remarkable speech and and our next program is uh on uh the twenty the three views of teaching of lord buddha uh by venerable master tins gaching uh venerable tins gaching <coughs> uh grew up in boston in usa and graduating from tips to university in uh 2005 in 2006 he took novice ordination from his holiness the dalai lama and uh, thereafter he enrolled at saraji monastery he received full the bhikshu ordination in 2009 <clears throat> since uh, ordination he has lived and study in saraji monastery uh so is yours tins gaching for 12 minutes thank, thank you. you yes uh thank you everybody welcome especially to our guests from other traditions um so today um i've been asked to speak about the three turnings of the wheel of dharma um so i'm aware that some of you might actually not accept three wheels of the turning wheels of dharma some of you from other traditions um so i thought it was a little interesting that i was asked to speak about that but i think the best way to present this uh is to show how our tradition understands the teachings of the buddha uh and see what we can have in common uh so even if you don't necessarily uh, accept some of these teachings uh you can understand be better what what they are about so you can understand how our tradition understands them uh so i want to see if i can do screen share here yes can you all see this yes okay so i've yes. prepared a, yeah, a, a presentation here the three turnings of the wheel of dharma so first we have uh the first turning turning of the wheel which i think all of us will accept this is said to have been 49 days after the buddha's enlightenment uh at deer park in in sarnath near varanasi um so here the buddha taught the turning of the wheel sutra uh what's the dhamma chakra sutra you would have that um to the first five disciples uh and then we have the the main topics of the first turning of the wheel are the four noble truths this is what he taught on this first day and then later he also taught about the 12 links of dependent origination uh the five aggregates 12 sense sources and 18 constituents and also the main practice uh, being the three higher trainings of ethical discipline concentration and wisdom uh, so obviously i can not explain all of these in detail but just to go quickly through the four noble truths which was the most important topic uh, that all uh all, we say all phenomena or all um, contaminated phenomena are in the nature of suffering and then secondly that there is a cause of suffering it does not arise causelessly and the cause of this suffering um, is karma and delusion and then thirdly there is a cessation it's possible for the suffering to end and finally the truth of the path that leads to that cessation and this of course is the the last topic here the three higher trainings so how do we uh achieve nirvana the freedom from suffering it's through practicing ethical ethical discipline uh then on top of that concentration and wisdom this is often compared to uh, we had the at the beginning of this talk we had the short prayer to the buddha uh and it said he is endowed with wisdom and knowledge i believe in english it was translated that way in tibetan with the rikpa tang jabzu dempa which literally means he has wisdom and legs uh this means that the ethical discipline and concentration are like the legs that support the body and the wisdom uh, that support wisdom uh without the legs of ethical discipline and concentration then wisdom cannot grow uh it's necessary to have these as a foundation so then we have the the picture here uh this illustrates the 12 links of um of dependent origination and also in the center we have the 
uh, three main delusions of uh, greed, ignorance, and hatred, and shows how being circle in this, but also, I don't actually think we can see it in this picture, but there's a little, there's a way out. There's the, the Buddhist teachings that allow us to escape from this wheel. So then the goal of the first turning of the wheel, uh, first of all, we have the four dhyanas or four jhanas to achieve, this is concentration. These are the four states of concentration that we can use to then develop wisdom. And with wisdom, we can achieve the state of stream enterer, um, that is Sotipana, I believe in, in Pali, I may be wrong if I'm mistaken, I'm sorry. Uh, once returner, non-returner and Arhat. Uh, so uh, an awakened being who is free of suffering. So then our tradition understands that one year later, uh, for certain select disciples, the Buddha gave a, a different style of teaching, the second turning of the wheel. So when we say turning of the wheel, I didn't explain this before, but the understanding is that um, the, the Buddha cannot transfer his realization to others. We have the, the saying of the Buddha that the Buddha does not wash away sins with water or dispel suffering with his hands. He does not uh, transfer his realizations to others, but by teaching the truth of Dharma, then he then beings are liberated. So, he, but it's understood that through teaching, then like a wheel that just goes from one place to another, then the Buddha, the, te the understanding of the Buddha can then be transferred to somebody else, not directly like surgically implanting it, but through somebody hearing his words and understanding. And that Dharma wheel continues. Uh, and when they achieve a direct perception of, of the truth of his teachings, then they also achieve the Dharma wheel because this, this wheel that they have, this, this direct understanding uh, has the power to cut through ignorance. So it's compared to a wheel because we have this, this the spokes of the wheel. So the, the hub of the wheel is the, again, the ethical discipline, then the rim of the wheel, concentration, and this supports the spokes, which then are the, there are sharp spokes that can cut through ignorance. So then the Buddha turned the wheel a second time, meaning that he gave an entirely new presentation um, that, that does not, the other ones, all the other sutras he gave them before were revolving around a particular theme. But here is a new theme. So it said that he gave this talk at Vulture's Peak, which is in Rajgirda, which is uh, in Bihar. So many of you might have visited this place before. And the sutra, uh, the perfection of wisdom sutra. So actually there's many of these. Not all of them were taught at Vulture's Peak, but many of them were. Uh, many of you will know the heart sutra. This is the most well-known one, uh, but also there's other very important ones, especially what we call the 25,000 verse perfection of wisdom sutra, it's much longer. So the main topics, um, first of all, emptiness. So the understanding here is that emptiness was not something he didn't teach before, that actually even in the first turning of the wheel, the Buddha did teach about emptiness because without understanding emptiness, one cannot actually achieve liberation. So when we say emptiness, I know we don't talk about some kind of nihilistic view that there's nothing exists, but rather that what does exist only exists in a relation to a particular way of, of conceiving it. Things exist based on our particular mental imp uh, impositions upon reality. So beyond that, we cannot pinpoint any one thing that exists in and of itself independently, independent of causes and conditions, independent of parts, and then especially independent of the way that our minds conceive of things. So this is very important for understanding how to be free of suffering. Because if we think that there's an, a solid me who's going to go to a solid place called Nirvana to be free of a solid suffering, this actually prevents us from being free. It, it actually increases our, our bondage. But when we understand that what we call suffering is based on a particular framework of understanding, then we, if we can dismantle that framework, we can also be free of the suffering. But what's different in the second turning is that the Buddha taught about emptiness much more explicitly and in much more detail, uh, explained it in terms of many different bases, we say, that not just that the person is empty, but everything, everything that we can uh, talk about um, is empty which is understood to be, one has to meditate on this much more deeply in order to achieve um, a higher goal, which I'll talk about in a minute. So also the Buddha taught the vast bodhisattva deeds that um, there are, in order to be free, uh, not only of, 
personal suffering, but in order to be able to liberate others, one has to have enhanced practices, um, greater merit. And this comes through um, um, uh, the six perfections, which we'll talk about in a moment, which support the wisdom uh, and support it to be able to um, be free of all obscuration, not just the obscuration to one's own nirvana, but the obscuration to being able to know the capacity of all beings. So here, the third uh, third topic is the all paths of spiritual beings, the different capacities. So one has to have a much broader mind. One has to think about uh, each, every different person and their particular disposition, not just be able to speak to one person about one thing, but understand where different people are coming from, from and being able to speak to them uh, in a, a way that they'll understand. So that's why we have this picture here, Bhavalokiteshvara, with 1,000 arms, with 1,000 eyes in each, one eye in each palm of the hand. That Avalokiteshvara can see all of the different beings in the universe and then reach out to them and teach them according to their capacity. Uh, so the way to do this, to, to achieve this state, is through the perfections of generosity, ethical discipline, patience, joyous, uh, joyous effort, concentration, and wisdom. So you'll see that three of these are the same as we had the three higher trainings, uh, but they're understood also here to be in, an enhanced version of that. For example, concentration, the concentration that's required here is understood to be a much deeper kind of concentration uh, that takes a lot longer time to cultivate. So then the goal of this, uh, of this is to, we have the ultimately to achieve full Buddhahood. So in the first turning of the wheel, the Buddha was quite explicit that he had, he had become a Buddha but he did not encourage his disciples to do so. Uh, he encouraged them to achieve arhatship. So there seems to be some sort of gap. Is there some reason that, the, that he can achieve that state but the other ones can't? And this is a question that's asked in the second turning of the wheel. Maybe it's possible that somebody else could also achieve that. And if so, how? So the way that the Buddha explained this is through the five bodhisattva paths and the 10 bodhisattva grounds. These are stages of realization, similar to the stream enter, uh, once returner, non returner, and arhat. And for the bodhisattva path, there are these different levels of, of realization. So we have the picture here of Santideva, uh, the, one of the great teachers of the bodhisattva path, and who's understood, you can see him floating here above the, the seat. The understanding is that uh, when he was giving his teaching, this, but through the force of his realization, he began floating in the air. Uh, this is a sign of somebody having um, you know, advanced and got, you know, gotten rid of the the weightiness of their heavy karma. So then we have the third turning of the wheel. This is uh, understood to have been 10 years after the Buddha was enlightened. Now, when we talk about the third turning of the wheel, there's actually two different ways to understand it. One is to talk about at Vaisali, uh, which is also, I believe in Bihar in Northeast India. Um, the Buddha taught the un Sutra unraveling the thought. And this is generally what we present as the third wheel. But there's also another way to understand the third wheel, which is the at Vulture's Peak, again, the Buddha taught the essence of the Tathagata Sutra. And I will actually focus on that because I think it's, it's more relevant to what we're talking about here in terms of stages of realization. So what this is understood to be, uh, the main topics here, um, the mind realizing emptiness. So in the second turning of the wheel, the Buddha taught about the object emptiness. He taught about the way things exist. Um, but then the question here, well, what about the mind that realizes emptiness? Uh, is it possible to focus, to enhance that? Um, so there's no, in this particular sutra, there's no, there's no object that's superior to emptiness as this topic of realization. But is it possible to enhance the mind, that the clarity of the mind realizing emptiness in order to, uh, in order to make uh, progress more quickly? And this comes into the topic of what's called Buddha nature. Um, so Tathagata Garbha, uh, or in, in Tibetan, we often tend to say Rik, or Dejan Shepi Ningpo is the is actual translation of Tathagata Garbha. But we also call it Rik, which means lineage. Um, the understanding here is that some, like for example, in ancient India, there was an idea of the caste system, that everybody is born with a particular potential and they cannot be, go beyond that potential. So Brahman is a Brahman, a Kasetria, the different castes are, are, are fixed in their um, particular caste from birth until death. But everybody has the same lineage of Buddha nature. It's not something that's limited to one particular person or one class of people or even in one particular species. 
anybody who has a mind, it's a natural function of the mind, a natural state of the mind. Um, so if the Buddha had said that he is a Buddha and others are arhats, well, this is challenging that idea. There's no reason that, not, that everybody can't become a Buddha because there's the, what we call the fundamental purity of the mind. The mind itself has a poten natural potential to become Buddha. It's, it's not something that was required that somebody has a particular is a position that makes them capable to become a Buddha and somebody else. So, for example, um, when some people are more have better dispositions for others than others at certain things. So two, two young boys might learn to play the violin and one of them might become much better than the other one. It seems like this person just has a natural propensity, we would say. Um, but everybody has this natural propensity to become enlightened. Anybody, if they practice these teachings, um, eventually they will be able to realize them and, and make progress. It's not limited just to people who uh, have you know, certain capabilities. And then we talk about the transformed nature of the afflictions, that um, it's a different way of understanding our afflictions, the of hatred and desire. So it's still understood that these are things that we want to get rid of. It's not that we want to maintain these in our minds, but when we talk about getting rid of them, simply the idea that I'm going to, like I'm going to take this out and throw it away, this itself actually becomes a bit of an obstacle in the same way that I talked about emptiness before, that we think we solidified them too much. Whereas actually the afflictions themselves, their very nature is, is pure. It doesn't mean that we want to keep them, but we relate to them in a different way. And in order to be rid of them, we actually have to embrace them in a certain sense. It doesn't mean that we act on them. That's a very important distinction. But that we can understand, by understanding their nature, we can be free of them. By understanding what they really are, uh, then they no longer control us. And we can actually uh, use that potential in the mind because it's, it's, we could say, it's just energy in the mind. For example, when we're angry, that's a lot of energy. And if we can use that same energy in a positive way, rather than just trying to suppress it or get rid of it, um, we can actually use that and to enhance our, uh, our progress on the path. So then the, the purpose is actually not different than the, the, the second turning of the wheel. So I didn't say the goal here because there's no different goal, the same goal of becoming a Buddha. But there's why then was, was the third turning wheel of the wheel taught if it has the same goal as the second turning of the wheel? Well, there's a purpose for doing so. And I've understood one is to counteract depression. Well, what this means is that when the Buddha taught that everything is empty, some people might hear that and become depressed and think, well, there's no point. Everything is meaningless. This is to show that actually there's a positive side. Emptiness also means infinite potential, that the mind itself has an, in, because the mind is not inherently one thing or the other. If we think that I'm inherently bad, I'm just a bad person, I can't do anything right. That's an incorrect belief that has to do with our way of, of thinking about things, but it's not really the way it is. If we understand the really the way our mind is, uh, we won't be depressed anymore because we understand that we have this potential for Buddhahood and also prevent disparaging less advanced beings. So that we, if we understand that everybody has the potential for Buddhahood, then we won't think that somebody, one person is superior or one person is inferior because everybody's the same uh, in having that same potential. It's not like I said, with different castes. It's not like somebody is necessarily higher than another. Everybody uh, belongs to the same family with this potential for Buddhahood. So in this sutra, the essence of the Tadakata Sutra, then it's illustrated by nine examples, which are very nice to look at. So I'll finish with these. Uh, understanding Buddhahood through nine analogies. So the first is there's a closed lotus in the mud. So we imagine out of mud, which we consider disgusting, out of this is born a beautiful lotus flower, but it's closed. And when it opens within the lotus Andrea flower- Andrea Yes, yes. Gajila, you have all two minutes. Please conclude minutes. in okay, two yes, minutes. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, secondly is honey in a beehive. So the beehive, if we're not careful, we'll get stung by the bees. But if we can access the true essence of the beehive, it's the sweet honey. Or wheat in a chaff, that there's something uh, nourishing inside, uh, even though outside it's, it's something very coarse that we don't want to eat. And fourth, divine ornaments in filth, that if we search through a rubbish heap, we might find some, some beautiful ornament. Uh, buried treasure. The analogy here is that there's a poor family who lives their entire life in poverty, and they don't realize that underneath their house is a buried treasure. 
So it's an analogy for this Buddha nature that we can live our entire life not realizing that we have this incredible potential inside. And the seed of a Bodhi tree, that this tiny, tiny seed can grow into this enormous tree that represents enlightenment. A priceless statue in dirty cloth. So imagine a, a you know, wonderful statue that somebody has wrapped in an old cloth. But if we can get rid of that cloth, we can access that. A wheel turning king in the womb of a poor woman. So imagine um, you know, there's the potential, uh, even though the, this woman herself is very poor, that she can give birth to this baby who will go on to become a fully enlightened being. And finally, uh, the ninth analogy, the gold statue in a clay mold. So we have a very uh, you know, mold for, for forming a statue. It's a very uh, uh, you know, poor, poor quality mold, but it can still, if we pour gold into it and mold that properly, then we can come with a, uh, again, a fully enlightened Buddha. So these are all analogies for uh, the natural potential of the mind. So thank you, uh, I will conclude with that. Thank you, yes. thank you very much uh, for venerable Dean yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much for your remarkable, remarkable uh, uh, speech. Now we have for QA section for ten minutes. So please un please unmute your <coughs> mic and uh, ask questions. Who want to ask? Mm-hmm. Okay. <clears throat> May I ask uh, uh, one question to Paramaha Sambu Sampu? Just uh just can you clarify a little bit about uh, Dharma form and Anu form? What are the difference uh between these two forms of Lord Buddha born in human? human life yeah. uh, actually when we talk about the buddha in the common sense we know that the buddha in the human form or the historical person especially in theravada tradition but in mahayana or vajrayana you may familiar be familiar with the, the dharma form but in dharma form is there about the, the form after the buddha enlightenment uh, that's why we call the he in the Dharma form. But Anu Buddha, Anu Buddha form is a, is a little Buddha. It's a mean uh, one who follow the Buddha. If we follow the Buddha, we can be the Buddha. Maybe the idea is very close to like a Buddha nature. <laughs> but in Theravada, we put this emphasis on the, we call the Anu Buddha. Anu Buddha is mean little Buddha. It's like a Chula, Chula Sotapanna. A little enterer, little enterer, or the sotapanna as Verabhan Hache talking about the uh, yeah the, the 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 stage of the enlightenment. But anyways, uh, this level I just want to clarify to all tradition that uh, most of the tradition we have the close uh, relationship of the um, the idea of the, the the explanation of the Buddha teaching. But anyway, with different background, with different, um, I mean, uh, culture or whatever, that's why make we have the different explanation to the different environments, uh, the, the, with the people, uh, different temperaments, territa. Yeah, that's why when we talk about the Buddha form, different, many kind of the form of the Buddha, whatever we try to put emphasis on. That means we very uh, we happy with this, but the other may be not happy or we're not comfortable with that. But they still have another explanation. <laughs> For example, as a, a moderator asking the, uh, to, to tell the difference about this. In Theravada, sometimes they, they're not familiar with the Buddha nature. Mm. 
But if you talk about the little Buddha, Anu Buddha, yes, ah, they get. <laughs> it mean, yeah, they come to them uh, because they learn the good example like uh, uh, Mahakasapa, you know, Kashupa, you know, Sariputta, Ananda, you know. This is the little Buddha. It means uh, the, the one who follow the Buddha. And this very good example for, for them, you know, to follow, you know, to family, to be familiar with. So so thank you very much. Lapsang uh, Punsok, uh, you know, for your uh, active uh, question. But anyway, I, I think it's, you know, already. <laughs> but thank you so much. We just want to share. <laughs> we want to share with the different tradition. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any questions? Uh, I, yeah, I, I would like to raise the question. The problem yes, in our yes. tradition, whatever time or the tradition, whether it be Theravada or what we call the Hinayana or Mahayana or Vajrayana or Tantrayana, whatever we call, this will be tradition. I, I think it's um, the celebration of Vesa. It has been handed down from the Ashoka period, you know, to celebrate like this, you know, but the problem is, I have the question, I myself have the question, for the modern people, uh, modern people, I mean the non-traditional, non-traditional Buddhist, or non-sectarian Buddhist, more and more people now, they, 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 they don't claim themselves to be one particular, or belong to any particular tradition. So the problem is, how, how they, um, you know, uh, understand or how they approach to the, approach the Dharma, you know, by their own way, in the modern way. So this is very challenging, you know, for ours. If we stick to only tradition, that is mean the tradition, I mean the explanation, traditional explanation. But for the modern people, sometimes they are Buddhist but they don't want to claim themselves Buddhist, but they are modern Buddhist, you know, or even sometimes they are non-Buddhist, sometimes non-religious, you know, but they appreciate, they value the Dharma, the Buddha Dharma, but they don't want to, you know, participate or attend any particular ritual. Sometimes they feel like, um, you know, uneasy. They feel uneasy. To, to adapt particular, uh, particular, I mean, uh, a tradition. So this is how we, sometimes we belong to one tradition can help the, I mean, uh, the modern people with the, the Buddha, the, the new interpretation of the Buddha, the Buddha teaching in the modern scientific. For example, uh, my thesis, <laughs> It's all about the interpretation of the universal responsibility of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. That is the I think is a, the the idea, the concept, the universal responsibility is very modern, modern term, you know, very modern term. It's not like a karuna. It's not like a meta when we talk in the Buddhist term. But the modern people, they, they're not familiar with the Buddhist traditional term, you know. So how, the problem is uh, how we as the modern generation, how we heal the modern, I mean, people, you know, to continue the Buddha Dharma in the modern society. This is uh, my, my question, yes. I want I want to hear from everyone. <laughs> uh, any any of you like a very good Tenzin Kache, you from the Western background. Yeah, you're familiar with this. So I want to hear from you, sir. Yes. Uh, I think as you ask about how you know people want to find something meaningful in Buddhism, but they might find the ritual or the tradition. Uh, does not suit their particular capacity. Um, so maybe this relates a little bit to what I was talking about uh, in terms of um, 
the understanding that we have to teach all beings according to their capacity. Uh, it's, we can't just have one way of explaining things that it fits for everybody. And so uh, for, for that, the most important thing is to understand different people. Um, you know, it doesn't help to try to, to explain to somebody if we don't really understand their background, because maybe we find out after uh, talking to them and trying to explain to them that actually they understand better than we do, but we didn't ask them to begin with, so we just assumed that we understood. So uh, it's very important, I think, and you know, I found this especially having come from a different culture uh, and then now living uh, in India for uh, 16 years now, um, that it, there are very many different ways of, of seeing things. And I, um, I can't say that one is right and one is wrong. So if I were to go back to my country in America and teach, um, you know, one of, the, one of the main things I would teach is about um, not just Buddhist philosophy in the traditional sense, but uh, applying that understanding that uh, what, you know, what we take for granted in our country in America, I can say, uh, is a scientific worldview. And we don't realize that we all have that worldview because we all share it. Uh, we all assume that this is just the way things are when really it's the way that we all choose to see things. And so, um, you know, in terms of Buddhist philosophy, this is what I would present. I would not say that your worldview is wrong. Uh, I would not say science is wrong, but to understand that it's it's right from a particular framework of understanding, um, and that um, you know it's not that we have to somebody has to adopt a different particular way of understanding, but it's to understand uh, different ways of, of seeing things. So in that regard, I think um, you know it, it would be much more like a, a dialogue rather than uh, a teaching in the traditional sense. Uh, in in the uh, Tibetan tradition, we talk about the three activities of a scholar, uh, which are to to teach, to compose, and to debate. But one of my teachers says that in the modern world, we need to uh, add a fourth uh, activity, which is dialogue. Because when we talk about teaching and 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 writing and debating, it's all as if we're trying to convince somebody else of something. But in the modern world, dialogue is very well accepted uh, in all different cultures for um, you know in politics, in economics, and in also in religious uh, in religious discussions. It's not about trying to convince somebody; it's about trying to learn from somebody. Um, so I think that's really how we have to approach it. Uh, if we, you know, if we want to see how Buddhism can benefit others, uh, is to be able to 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 dialogue with them. I, I hope that I've answered your question. If there's anything I missed, please please remind me. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate your uh, explanation very very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for venerable uh, Param Maha Sampong and. Uh, uh, Master Tinsugachi for your question and answer. So, so I think uh, our QA section consumed uh, time more than 20, 10 minutes. So our next uh, uh, program is panel discussion on life of events, life events of Lord Buddha and how the teaching of Lord Buddha promotes world religion, religious harmony. So I would like to ask uh, Venerable Tinzi Dojila for uh, talk a little bit about how the teaching of Lord Buddha promotes uh, world religious harmony for maybe two minutes, two or three minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, Venerable Prama Songpong, he asked that question. So it's same here. So the atomic topic, the how can Buddha's teaching promote the whole harmony? So also at the beginning, so, uh, so how can we promote uh, whole harmony through the Buddha's teaching? So if we, yeah, if we say, if we use the Buddha's teaching as a traditional way of, uh, way to, to promoting Buddha's teaching, so I think it's like become, we are, uh, so 
it become like a more promo pro provocating for the teaching. So the best way to pro the promoting uh, all harmony is normally we used to say, or from also his Holiness used to say the secular way of teaching. So we we can use the secular way of teaching, but the teaching secular way of secular way. So through applying Buddha's teaching, but mental, the main thing is we teach or practice Buddha's teaching, but not just the traditional way of teaching through the secular way, where the old, whether religious people or whether the believer or non-believer all can understand. We can use those terms and those practice to apply Buddha's teaching. And through this way, we can uh, bring all tradition together. So as normally we say, when we say term compassion, so promoting compassion through the promoting compassion or so we can bring all the, the religious together because all the religious religion, they're promoting the compassion. So through this way, we can promote, you need to become, uh, you need it through the religions and also we can use that term as a secular way. So I think through this way, we can promote the whole harmony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, I would like to ask Penjula to talk a little bit about on uh, life events of Lord Buddha or, uh, other than our four topics, which we already discussed. Penjula, are you there? I think he's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I ask uh, Tingzi Kachila, can you talk a little bit about uh, one of other uh, Lord Buddha's event, I mean from 12 dates, other than uh, four uh, events which we already discussed? Okay, so you asked about the 12 deeds of the Buddha. Yes. Um, yeah, so there's there's different <laughs> like everything. There are slightly different enumerations of these, but uh, the one that I remember, which I believe is is presented in the Uttara Tantra, uh, we have the, the abiding in Tushita, and then coming to uh, be born, or coming enter in the womb. We start with conception and then birth, and then after birth, um, we have uh, abiding in the palace and um, showing the aspect of uh, enjoying worldly life, being married and having, uh, you know, training to be a king. Uh, and then renunciation, uh, leaving the palace after seeing the, the four sites of birth, death, uh, not birth, uh, of uh, age, aging, sickness and death, and also uh, seeing a renunciate and then wishing to follow that life. Uh, and then after that, training in asceticism for six years, uh, after that, um, achieving full enlightenment, and then after that, teaching the Dharma, and finally passing into Nirvana. So I think we've, we've already covered the latter three of those. So in terms of the first ones, um, you know, perhaps uh, the renunciation is, is, an, is a useful topic. And you know, that the Buddha, uh, as I said, he, he is said to have, uh, according to the legend, uh, have been born with all of the great um, wonders of a palatial life, living in a palace, uh, having uh, all of the pleasures that he could want, um, and still being dissatisfied. I think this is a very strong message uh, of the Buddhist teaching. It's a bit radical, actually. Um, you know, I think sometimes it's overlooked that the Buddha, from many people's perspective, we would say he, he did something quite uh, you know, not not a good thing to do. It's a a a, um, a negative action by leaving behind his wife and child, uh, and and also leaving behind his responsibility as uh, as a king. Uh, so uh, we have that the Buddha, after, you know, after recognizing that the pleasures of life were hollow, were not would not leave lead to ultimate happiness. Uh, he then gave uh, left his in the middle of the night, ran away. Um, so the question is, um, we might say, was he running away from something or was he running towards something? So certainly in our tradition, we believe he was running towards something. Otherwise, we wouldn't be following him. Uh, that the Buddha recognized that uh, even though 
yes, it's true that in generally speaking, one has a great obligation to one's family to take care of one's family. And if one has the position of a leader to take care of one's subjects, still there's an even greater obligation that we have uh, because that does not limit it to one particular class of people. And I think this is the message that the Buddha was sending. If the Buddha had stayed with his wife and child, uh, we wouldn't still be celebrating his, his deeds 2,500 years later because it would have been a very small contribution but the Buddha recognized there's something much greater that uh, is worth going after, um, even though it is very hard. Uh, and uh, the Buddha then showed the aspect of practicing asceticism for six years, showing how difficult this is. Um, so certainly something you know, I feel in terms of Buddhist practice, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a, in some sense, it's very challenging. Um, all of us, you know, might consider ourselves Buddhist, um, you know, but there, there's definitely, we have to make sure we remember there's a big difference between a, a Buddhist and a Buddha. Um, so whatever stage we're at, we recognize that it's actually possible uh, to achieve something much greater. It, it's, it's the potential that we have. Um, and we have to look at, in our current capacity, what can we do? What can we, how can we get go towards that? Uh, we might think, oh, I can't do it. Uh, but then the, then the question we would ask, we like to debate here at Sarah J. Uh, why not? Why, why can't you do it? Um, is there something holding you back? Or is there some reason that you have, you don't have that potential? Um, and in Buddhism, we never take anything uh, just because somebody else said so. The Buddha was very clear about this. Uh, do not take my words just because I said so. Don't take it out of respect for me. Don't take it out of tradition. Don't take it out of um, deference to what others say. Examine it for yourself. Examine if what I said was true uh, and see if this is something really worth striving for. And if you find that it is, then uh, fortunately, the Buddha taught us how he did it. And maybe we can do that ourselves if we follow. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Tinsukajila. So... Is there any question on uh, Facebook Live? Maybe not. Okay. So we have still five minutes. Pendula, do you have any suggestions to aid? Mm -hmm. Yes. on uh, <laughs> life events with Lord Buddha and uh, the teaching of Lord Buddha's promote world religious and harmony. Mm. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, extend a very warm thanks to you all, venerable speakers. Uh, I have received the lots of the messages from you all. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the teaching of the Lord Buddha promotes the whole religious tradition. Because when I think about the harmony or the religious harmony, when we talk about the religious harmony, the when uh, if we need a very religious harmony, if we need a really external harmony, external uh, harmony, external disharmony. We need a, a internal harmony. And uh, to have an internal, in order to have an internal harmony within us, so we, we need to understand the, those disturbing emotions which, which disturb, disturb the, the peace of mind, inner peace. And uh, so what are the, those disturbing emotions which always disturbs our uh, the inner peace? So when we uh, reflect on ourselves or reflect on our own emotions, so the anger, hatred, and the wrong views are the some uh, some sort of the disturbing. This, these are the really disturbers. This disturbs the peace of mind. 
This disturbs the internal harmony within the individuals. Then next, what is the key antidote to those disturbing emotions, those destructive emotions? So one way I think that the, the compassion actually is the key message of the Buddha. And uh, not only the, the key message of the Buddha, it is the message of all world religious traditions. So within the, the Buddhist uh, cycle of the teaching, uh, compassion is the key message. It is the responsibility of all the Buddhist uh, brothers and sisters to put the to put action, uh, the, to put compassion into action. So if we really try our best to generate the heart of the compassion within each and every individual's life, then through that way, I think we can really create a. Uh, inner peace within if there is the internal harmony within individual then that individual can be a group it can it, that individual can create a, a harmonious society harmony com community because community means a group of the a group of so, the, the people so that community can be a the harmonious community and community and harmonious society and through that way, the society, the people who is grown from that society, the, the student who came from that society can be a really, uh, uh, really friendly to each other, the best on that, the foundation, the practice of the compassion. So through that way, I mean that internal, external harmony, religious harmony, I think best on the internal harmony. And, uh, and that internal harmony can be developed in the, with the understanding of the uh, pratya samupada, interdependence, interdependence. Because we can understand somewhere we, we feel that uh, we are very, uh, we may feel that, uh, that I'm, uh, I'm not relevant to those people, so the mind, the happiness or the, uh, the the uh, something because I have the, uh, the the clothes or the food I I I live on those clothes and the, the food and drinks but we may think that I have I got those clothes or the individuals uh, because of the my own effort we may think like that but we receive the many things in dependence upon the many the individuals the thousands of the people through the through the effort of the thousand people we receive the, the happiness and the clothes and the food. So I mean that with the understanding of the interdependence, pratya samupadada, and with the practice of the compassion within the one's own heart, we can really make a great differences. We can make a really contribute to, uh, to a, contribute to a happy society. So this is what I feel. And the second thing is, I think it, uh, there is a big difference between the respect and the faith. We need to respect all world religious tradition. And we, need, we should have a faith towards the one's own, the, uh, the one's own religion, which, which suits oneself the best. It means that, that Buddhism suits me the best, but I cannot say that Buddhism is the best for all. But to the Hindu, Hindu people, the Hinduism is the best for him. So in this, uh, for this reason, I should respect the Hindu followers because Hinduism suits him best and through the, the teaching of the Hinduism so that he can receive the lots of the ways to uh, generate happiness within himself. So likewise, all world religions have the potential to make their own followers a good person, have the potential to bring happiness to themselves have the potential to make them a better life. So through that sense, we should respect all world religions. So, and the, the third one, I would like to add one thing, the concept of the, 
it is the, the message of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. One truth, one religion, several truth, several, several truth, several religions. So then that uh, within the scope of the individual idea, one truth, one religion is relevant. The concept of one truth, one religion is relevant. But the, within the society, so then we should have the understanding of the one, the several truth, several religions. Because in the society, so there are the different kinds of the people. Different, different people have the different mental disposition, different moods, different needs. So then the one religion cannot satisfy all those different uh, needs and different moods and different mental positions. So there should be the different kinds of the world religious tradition, of course. So in that society level, in the broad sense, we should have a very idea that several truths, the concept of the several truths, several religions dealing is the uh, much more suitable for a, a larger society. This is the way I would like to share with this. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Panjala, the director of uh, English Deep, uh, Translated Department of Sarah J University. Uh, I think uh, I'm going to conclude the panel discussion on the life events of Lord Buddha and how the Buddha's teaching promotes all religious harmony here. So our final and last uh, program is thank you and uh, dedication speech by Venerable Hundu Soba. And he's uh, uh, one of senior translators of Sarah J. Monastic Translate Department. Uh, Venerable Nuru Zabala, you have five minutes. Thank you. Please unmute your... Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Uh, I think I cannot hear your voice. Sevalak, your mic is not working, please. Your mic is not working. Okay. Yeah, I oh, can no. hear. No, now no, it, no. Now it's working. Now okay. it's working. Now it's okay? <laughs> yeah, now it's working, I think. Okay. Okay. So you guys didn't hear from the start, right? Nope. <laughs> okay. Please just. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, hello everyone. <laughs> Good evening. And my name is Lundu Sopa. Uh, before concluding this uh, program, uh, on behalf of Seraja Translation Department, uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Venerable uh, Mahapara Sambo. And your, <laughs> your presentation was wonderful. I will feel very great. And also, uh, I would like to gratitude Venerables uh, Buddha Data. Uh, he already live, I think, from this program. And also, uh, our Venerables Tenzin Gachala. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 